Welcome to the Ken McElroy <laughs> Show. I'm your host, Neil. <laughs> hey, everybody. Ken. How are you guys today? We're just having some fun yeah. uh, leading up to this. Uh, hey, uh, welcome. I uh, hope you guys had a great weekend. Definitely, definitely. Oh, yeah. um, so today's uh, Master Horse Tip of the Week, we always start with that, is never get an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, you definitely want to do something that's a sale yeah. mortgage. Yeah, before we jump off of that, so so well, what you guys need to pay attention to, I think, when you're, when you're looking at mortgages or interest rates, the, you, you'll always know what the bank wants by what they're offering you. So it's like like when I used to live in Vegas, like you knew that the occupancy was low at $89 or $99 rooms, that those were like the teaser rates to get you to stay at some place. Same thing with interest rates. So you're gonna see these really tempting, tempting offers. And so be careful because it'll look like a better deal, but it might be for one year or two years or something like that. So just be careful and um, think long-term. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. So we have people from all over today. Cincinnati, Toronto, Europe, Turkey. They're just all Ooh, over the world watching. Good, so good, good, cool. good. Well, Trying thank you. Shout out shout out to everyone. Yeah. I have no idea what time it is in Europe or Turkey. But <laughs> um, nice to have you guys. So this weekend, we basically just did nothing. Oh, well, that's not true. I did a lot. That's you true. did nothing. I, did nothing. <laughs> I So I, I, I sold a home. And I had all this really cool art, so I love uh, I like art, and um, and so I had it all shipped down to Arizona, and um, and anyway, it was cool actually unpacking it all and and kind of getting it ready to uh, display again in uh, our home in Arizona. Yeah, it's looking good. Took but... took, yeah, took took two days. Yep, and you're on day seven of your ten day class. Day eight. Day eight. Uh, yeah, I'm on a detox. I you guys might know I do. Two a year, uh, and uh, I feel so much better. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, if you guys are watching, make sure you hit the like button. We always appreciate that, as you know. And also, um, we're doing another free webinar on wholesaling. Um, so make sure you check that out. It is next week. Um, go ahead and sign up at kemacroy.com forward slash webinar. It's a great, you know, wholesaling is great if you have no money and you're trying to get started. Anybody, you know, you don't need money to do it. So it's a great way to get into real yeah, estate. It is. It's a great way to learn. Yep, totally. So today we're going to be talking about lessons from a pro investor. Yeah, yeah. So that would be you. We started talking about this over the weekend. You know, we kind of narrowed it down to five lessons. You know, what are the top? There's a lot, obviously. There's a lot of lessons. Yeah, but, yeah. but we picked five and, and we're going to talk about those. And, and so, you, you know, some of these are hopefully not too foreign to you guys. And hopefully you adopt these because... These are well thought through. These are things that we talked about re literally over the whole weekend while we were figuring, you know, or working on all the art stuff. And uh, we came to these top five. So hopefully you enjoy them. Yes, definitely. So the first one is a mistake that I kind of made. Yeah. Which was paying off my properties as I go. Yeah. So this is really common. So, you know, essentially it's this is all about debt. I was afraid of debt. Yes. As I understand this, you, you know, if you take a look at there's kind of, you know, there's good debt and there's bad debt. And of course, hopefully, you know, the difference. So, so good debt is debt that's used that other people pay off for you. And bad debt is debt that's used for like credit card debt or things, you know, where you're racking up debt and you're paying these 18 to 20, 22% interest rates. So those are the two kinds of debt. And unfortunately, not all debt is treated the same or, uh, and so debt is kind of a bad word. I mm -hmm. guess. And so like you, like my parents, like my brother, like, you know, so many others that they don't like to be in debt. They have this stigma around debt. And, and I'll tell you guys, as we're moving into this next period and uh, the facts are the facts, you know, we have high inflation right now. Cash is a liability and debt is an asset right now because of inflation. So if you can fix debt, then you're actually beating inflation. So so I, it's hard to wrap your head around, but this is kind of the mistake a lot of people use. The The whole point, if, if you think of, you know, I did a talk in Dallas uh, about a month ago 
actually with Kiyosaki and and um, George Gammon and Ron Paul was there and uh, Simon Black and and a whole bunch of really really smart people and we talked about my talk was be the Fed because you know right now the you know everywhere people are printing cash adding cash to the you know to take care of everything and we're not going to go down this rabbit hole and say why the point is they are so the countries states they're all getting more in debt to take care of the people period so so be like that you know do what they're doing well just as like a general example i mean i you know paid cash for my first two properties and if i would have just put down you know the 20 percent down payment I could have a much bigger you, portfolio. Yeah, right now you have three and you probably could have had five or six. Yep. That, yeah. So, you know, history is a tough lesson. <laughs> it is. I mean, and, it didn't turn out bad for me, but no, it could have been better. No. And the other thing is, let's don't discount the fact that you have a lot more cash flow. Yeah. So, you know, and that was your goal back then was to be financially free. But I think a lot of times people are that, you know, they, they you, you need to look at debt as a tool. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, there are times to use it and times not to use it. So I don't use debt, obviously, for buying uh, anything that goes down in value. Right. Period. I don't use debt for land. I just pay for land. You don't want to be. I, there are things that I have, like the resort that I own in Sedona. There's no debt on it. And the reason I could put a lot of debt on the things worth a lot of money. Uh, but I don't want to ever have, uh, you know, I want the cash flow to be able to, to produce. So it's, there's, there's choices that you can make around what you should have debt on and what you shouldn't. But the general rule is if your debt is covered with somebody else paying it, not you, not from your paycheck, you know, somebody else, then it's tr then it's better. You know, a lot of people use debt to cover inventory. Let's say, let's say they're a manufacturing company and they have to take, lines of credit that's debt um to pay that down you know while they're managing people that are paying them that's different that's using debt in your business so there's a time to use debt that can be your friend and um and also uh, the other thing is we don't really talk about leverage here but i don't inc i don't uh advise having too much debt too much leverage so right. you want to have that so um you know, like during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, Ross and I, we immediately started to take a look at our loan to value on all our assets and what our what we call our break even though us. So our break even is simply expenses plus debt. So what is that number and how much revenue do I need to have to cover it? So generally we're in the low 60s. So that means that I only need to collect 60 percent, you know, I think it was 62 or 63 percent of all our income to cover our income, or I'm sorry, our expenses and our debt. So that's what we call our break even. Anything over that is obviously cash flow. So, so that's where you need to be thinking. So in your case, um, I would advise if you had, let's say long-term tenants in there and, um, and you do and have had, you know, maybe 50% debt, maybe 60% debt, but that's hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of money that then you can now scoop and use, and especially if you fix it at say two and a half or three percent, which is what the number is, and use to go out and buy more stuff and and hedge inflation because you're borrowing, well, right now, at least two points below inflation. Yes, definitely. So, so that's kind of the philosophy is is not to just consider debt bad. Like I grew up that way. My parents would say. Do not get in debt, pay off your debt, pay off your house. My parents paid off their house and obviously a long time ago. I remember as a, as a young kid when they were so happy when their, their home was paid off and they lived debt free generally for the rest of their lives. Um, nothing wrong with that during the time, but gold was tied to the gold standard then, guys. In the 70s, Nixon took it off the gold standard and currency became what's called a fiat currency. And now that currency floats. They can add as much as they want. It, it's not tied to gold anymore. So just go back and look in your history books and take a look at all this. It's fascinating. If you want to really uh, freak out, just type in how much has the dollar devalued in the last 20 years? That's all you have to do. Just type it in Probably Google. in the last year. Well, yeah, well, yeah a year. <laughs> But just go back and look. It, there's a there's an actual visual I saw with it has a one dollar bill and it just shows it going down like this. Um, so that's what we're trying to fight.
You're not going to win the fight, but you can certainly manage to it. You know, um, on YouTube, Josh has a great question, and I actually get this question a lot. Um, after he saves, he's a renter. Mm. After he saves the 20%, should he buy a rental property or buy himself a primary residence? Yeah. So if you can, do the house hack method. Yeah. You know, so what you can. So I have a friend that just did this. He's a young kid. I love this kid. Uh, you know, he's a musician and he's the lead singer of this band and he's, you know, up, up in the Coeur d'Alene, Spokane area. And I sat and had coffee with him and his mom and dad. Uh, it was cool. And, um, you, you know, this was his issue. So he had saved a bunch of money doing, you know, his stuff and he ended up finding a, a home and ended up and had ended up having a rental component to it, a separate entrance. So you have to be thoughtful around that. So it doesn't have to be an either or. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, you should look at and I have another another young kid where my, my good friend's son uh, is in the military and um, and so he was at uh, Air, uh, Fairfield Fairfield. Uh, Air Force Base, I think, in in, in the Spokane area, and um, he did this. He bought a four bedroom home and rented three of the house, three of the rooms out to some of the guys. Well, listen, you don't really need a separate yeah. interest. Like even um, Josh, even if you buy a condo and yep. it's a two bedroom, you can rent the other bedroom yep. out. Yep. yep. Um, and another thing to consider is sometimes people have real. You have a really good deal on your rent. You know, if you're running from a landlord and they're That's not charging point. you very much, it might make sense to just buy something and rent it out. Yeah. You know, it depends on your specific situation. Yeah. 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 But you do want to take advantage of, of the, um, using debt and, and, and where the market's heading because real estate prices are inflating, mm -hmm. um, as a result of what's happening right now. So, so, um, it doesn't have to be an either or you can do both. You can buy a primary residence and, and rent out the piece. And the goal of course is to figure out a way to cover that mortgage. Yeah. So if you're able to use your 20% and then rent that, you know, upstairs above the garage, you know, back basement or whatever it is to cover, then now you basically move, use your 20%. You moved into the house. Somebody else is paying for it. Yep. And Michael brought up a good point. He says you don't even need the 20% if you house hack since you're going to live there. Yeah. So you might really be able good to find yep. Yep, a lesser Great point. Loan. Yep. Um, so let's move on to the next thing that we've learned. Um, this was yours. You said you would engage a property manager before you buy. Yeah. So now this might seem odd, but one of the things that actually is funny, well, I'll tell you two stories. The first one was, um, when some, when I was raising capital way back in the days, 20 plus years ago. And my, my buddy said, Hey, this, this guy wrote this purple book called rich dad, poor dad. And, um, and, uh, you know, he just kind of retired and he lives in Phoenix and I'm like, well, introduce me. Cause I'm raising money for deals I was doing. So obviously it was Kim and Robert. This is the very first meeting. So I grabbed, went to rich. Dad, I went to the store, grabbed rich dad, poor dad and read it real quick in the book. Robert says the most valuable person on your team is the property manager. And the first thing I said to him when I sat down with him, this is a true story for lunch. I said, I've never seen anybody say that because <laughs> <You know? laughs> nobody really like understands, you know, the value of a property manager. A good one. Yep. And so, you know, and, and that was the, my very first thing I ever said to Robert and Kim. And we had a long chat about that because that was my background. And so what would happen was, and I'll give you a really cr crazy, crazy story. Um, one of the, I used to do a lot of fee management back in the day. And there was a guy, he had like a 30 unit building in San Diego and he was literally on his boat. It was all paid off and he would go and collect the, you know, they had washer and dryers and stuff like that. And he was like sailing and enjoying himself in San Diego and all this stuff. And it was full. And the thing was a cash cow. It was like awesome. And I don't know if it was all paid off, but it was really paid down quite a bit. He, he owned it for a while and he bought it back when he was working a lot. So it's only 30 units, but it was San Diego. So prices were up. So some broker convinced him, you know, I don't know if you realize how much this thing's worth, but it's worth a lot. And back in the day, maybe, you know, let's call it $10 million or something. So the guy's like, Oh, I can do this again. I can roll this. And so he, he, he put the building uh, in escrow and actually sold it. And then he wanted to do a 1031 exchange. And he found a property in Mesa, Arizona, which is where I, I the area I'm from. Lot, it was like 150 units and, and, and to, to save on tax. And then the day before he closed, he called me as the property manager, can you help? 
<laughs> so I'm like, of course I can help. So now he's done all of this by himself, you know, and not thinking about this. So, and so the very first thing was I'm like, I don't know if you realize what you're buying, but what you're buying is something that's full of, of bad stuff. You know, it's got some uh, r real issues around occupancy. It's got some real issues around uh, the tenants and it's got a lot of deferred maintenance. So, you know, I'm just letting you know it's yes, it's significantly bigger. And, and so the story was, is if he would have engaged us even two months earlier, that's it. I, we would have just went out and fed him that information for free because as a property manager, you're getting that contract. And the last thing that you want to do is, 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 um, you know, take on a building that, um, you know, is, is has high, uh, you know, low occupancy issues and high deferred maintenance and high capital, all that kind of stuff. That's the very last thing that you want to do. And, but he took that on. So he took this problem over and, and a property manager, if they're going to take something on, they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to say, Hey, I don't think that you're going to be able to get these high rents. I don't think you're going to, you know, this is an issue here. I, let me take a look at your operating expenses. Let me take a look at your, your resident mix. Let me take a look at where your rents are set. And let me take a look at the vacancies. Let me take a look at the condition of the vacancies. And so you need to engage a property manager to verify both seller and broker information before you take it over. Um, and this, this turned out to be a disaster for this guy because all of a sudden he was flying over to Arizona. The thing wasn't cash flowing because it had low occupancy and, and, um, and he had a bunch of work to be done. And, and so he went from this basically sailing, uh, literally out in the San Diego Bay to flying back and forth to Mesa, Arizona, trying to, uh, you know, trying to fix this you know, this issue and eventually it got fixed, but it cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a horrible, horrible mistake. Obviously he was pissed, but you know who he's pissed at? Guess. Mm, himself? The property manager. Oh. <laughs> right? The bearer of bad news. So he's not pissed at his own actions. He's not pissed at the broker. He's pissed at the emails and the data that work that we're giving him. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm like, dude, your your anger is is directed the wrong way. You need to be pissed at yourself for the you know, stupid decision that you made. And and, um, you, you know, and so that is um, a great story of, of utilizing a property manager early. And um, and so it, I'm telling you guys. But what would somebody use a property manager for well, all exactly? of those things that I mentioned earlier? Right. OK. So those. OK. Um. And then another good tip is to start with the exit of the money and work backwards. Yeah. So obviously you guys know that we're buying hold, right? So um, this is not about selling the property. So uh, I'll give you an example on the billboard, you know, the billboard example that I use all the time, the, we, we bought a, uh, bought a piece of land with a billboard in the middle in the middle of right in the middle of the property we moved the billboard later and the i wanted the billboard i didn't really want the land so i wanted the billboard because it was a monthly cash flow well so my thought was and the land wasn't very expensive it was like 280 grand so we bought the land moved the billboard it was like 20 grand to move the billboard so now i'm into the thing for like 300 grand i put an easement around it that cost me another 15 or 20 thousand in legal so now I've got the land plus a billboard sitting over here with an easement around it. And so I, then I relist the land and um, the land sold for 310 grand. So I'm almost, I almost got all my original capital back. But what I kept was the billboard that now produces, you know, anywhere from two to $4,000 a month in net revenue for free basically. And that's what I'm talking about. So, so when we invest, uh, that's a, obviously a very small example and I did sell the land, but I sold the land for, um, not more than I might, my, my, I didn't have a capital gain issue. And so I basically put my money out, got it back, kept a billboard cash flows. And that is the plan. So if you're raising your money or you're using, um, if you're raising other people's money or using your money, the goal is always, how do I get my 
my income back? How do I get my rent back? So I'm always thinking about infinite return and I'm always thinking about passive income, those two things. So how do I get my money back tax free? And how do I continue to generate passive income? And then when I do that, you know, through, let's call it a cash out refinance, then I put that in new stuff. And so it's, you know, it's, it's what I call velocity of money. So you're, you're always trying to move your money. So I've had this question a few times. People have asked, why did you sell those 10 projects that we sold a couple of years ago? We sold, uh, for those of you who don't know, we sold a couple hundred million dollars worth of stuff. And um, what I don't often talk about is what we did with the proceeds, you know? So yes, we killed it, right? You know, and, and so the whole idea was to move the money into assets that uh, using a 1031, into new assets that uh, are now worth a lot more and producing a lot more. So, so as you're constantly messing around with your money and your investment and maybe your uh, investors' money, uh, which you obviously need to get their approvals on, but um, it's always about how do you get that money back tax-free? How do you keep the property, get that money back tax-free, and produce passive income? That's the entire goal here, and um, and and so. Uh, it's not about selling the property and it's very, very different. And you have to learn this. It comes through experience. It's very different than a flipper's mentality mm -hmm. and, um, and a wholesaler. And, you know, yeah. those are great ways to learn, but I've seen certainly in the, in the late eighties, um, when I first got into the business in the nineties and the two thousands, uh, especially, uh, um, you know, 2007, 2008, at some point, flippers get burned because <laughs> right. you roll it's the gambling. money. Yeah, it's you know, it, it's a great Calculated way. Calculated gambling. It's a great but... way to be in the business. It is, you know, and there's nothing wrong with buying homes and selling them for more. Nothing, but it's transactional. It's you have to do it again. <laughs> you have to do it again to feed the beast. And what we're trying to what we're trying to teach here is passive income, and it's a lot harder. It's a, it takes a lot more experience. It takes a lot more discipline. But once you get that, once you get that passive income to cover your monthly expenses, then you really truly do have your time back. And that's actually the issue here. We're trying to get our time back. And, um, you know, and it's also, it, once, you, once you can cover whatever your monthly expenses are through passive income, which you did, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of freedom to this. A lot. And then you can work as hard as you want, but you're always sitting over here knowing that this is always covered. You don't have to be transactional. You don't have to do a development deal. You don't have to be, do a syndicated deal just to cover, you know, the expenses and keep that, you know, that overhead burn that you, that all of us have. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. Um, Christian had, or yeah, Christian had uh, something to say from YouTube. Um, she said, or he said that they're undocumented, but have $150,000 cash in the bank. So what do you recommend for them to get a loan? Do you have any suggestions for that? Uh, I don't understand the question. So, so they're not a legal citizen. Oh. But they do have $150,000 cash. Oh, wow. Uh, boy, that's a touchy one. Yeah. Um, well... Uh, here, here's the thing. There are, uh, I know we have some foreign investors in our property deals and mm -hmm. what we do is we make sure that they have a U.S. entity that they invest through. So let's say a Canadian group or a, a group out of Mexico, which is the only reason I'm bringing those two up is because those are the ones that come up the most. Mm -hmm. um, they actually form a U.S. entity or a U.S. bank account, put the money in there, and then that money transfers into our deals. So that's the way that we do it internally because there are tax issues and things like that The that um, um, you know the government wants, of course, and, um, and there's a bunch of reporting requirements and things like that, so. Okay, very good to know. Well, the next thing that we recommend that you guys do is shop around for loan rates. Very important. One. Yeah. So this is the fourth one. So I hear this a lot. Like, you know, <laughs> people are like, yeah, well, I just I bank with Wells Fargo and that's where I got my home loan. You know, and right. They keep it that simple. They don't look anywhere. Yeah, else. Yeah. Yeah. And you used to work at a bank. Right. I so did, why, why don't you yeah. talk about how with banks, you know, banks are under a lot of, uh, you know, they're they're motivated to, to, to 
place money, right? Well, the thing with banks is, you know, they already have customers coming in. So that makes it easier for them to attract business, right? Because you're already there. You bank with Chase or whoever you bank with. And a lot of people just assume that all the banking rates are the same and all the closing costs are the same and just everything's the same. Right. And very rarely do people actually shop around for that. And just in my own experience, even when I worked at the bank, I really wasn't aware of um, other options other than a bank to get money from because I wasn't in the position to, to do that. Um, but what you find is a lot of times these smaller loan companies are more flexible on their terms. They sometimes have better rates. They have different closing costs. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of more options than just your big banks. Yeah. So so what happens is, guys, is um, debt and equity and savings, you know, it's very competitive business. There's a lot of people trying to get your money somehow mm -hmm. and loan you money through a credit card, through auto loans, through home loans. Uh, they're trying to get you to, they're trying to get you to put money into insurance products or pensions or 401ks and ba bank accounts and savings rates and all that stuff. Okay. That's what the entire financial industry is for. And they're all after you. So you just got to think about that. It's extremely competitive. Now, what's really cool with the internet, and not that it's new, but you can go on the internet and take a look. So I'll just give you an example. I've used this before, but my son was looking, uh, he's looking at buying another car. And um, <clears throat> he just got out of college, and, and, um, and uh, so I said, why don't you go look online and take a look at the rates? And he's like, oh my God, they're all over the place. Now this is a car, not a home, but it's the same. It's competitive. It's, it think of it like buying a car. Think of it how, you know, so when a, a, a dealer is that, well, the reason they offer those zero percent or 1.9 or zero, uh, 2.9, or you know how they scale them and all this kind of stuff is to keep you there and finance you to buy the car. And so they get, they get two bites of the apple. They sell you a car and they get money from placing the financing it's the same so you know so 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 he went out and looked and he found that there was a of all things a uh, credit union was offered this great great rate and i'm like oh wow and on used cars which is he's trying to buy a used car which i highly recommend and and he um he, uh, he went over and he put $100 and opened a bank account with the credit union just so that he was now a member because you have to be a member. And so now he uses that when he's out or used to that when he went out and was negotiating with these banks because now he has, his, again, he's walking in with, with his own information. Yeah. And, and it was like a 1.9% uh, 60 month, like, incredible rate like he was like what do you think of this and so the point is this when we go out and find deals like like we do as you guys know even on a big big um you know on big projects we get six eight nine ten bids uh, from different people trying to lend us money it's hard to believe but it's true and you cannot believe the terms <laughs> They're different on the loan to values. They're different on the spreads, which is the difference between LIBOR. Um, they're, they're different on, um, you know, on the different hurdle rates, on the prepayment rates. And of course, I'm talking about com uh, commercial re uh, residential real estate now, but the, 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 the loans are, um, they can widely vary. Well, and also on your smaller entities, they can use a little bit of common sense that banks can't use. So from my experience working at the bank, it was very cookie cutter. You either fit the, you know, you fit in the box or you didn't fit in the box. And it didn't really matter common sense wise if you didn't fit in the box, they you're couldn't give about, you a loan. You're talking about um, with the W-2? Just anything. So like, for example, you know, we had a guy where, his house was worth five hundred thousand dollars. He was trying to refinance like one hundred and fifty grand of it. It was paid off, but they wouldn't do it because he had sold straw on his property like thirty years prior, <laughs> and they said it made it farm property, and they wouldn't do the loan. When, you know, I mean, any bank would do any. So then he had to go to a credit union. The credit union would do the loan because they he had perfect credit, doctor, you know, all the things, right? Uh, and then also, yeah, with the W two, like I was trying to put down. I think a hundred grand on my first place and I needed like a $30,000 loan and I actually couldn't get it from the bank because 
they said no because I wasn't a W-2, but I was putting down a hundred grand on a hundred and thirty thousand yeah. dollar condo at the time. Um, but your smaller entities, your smaller credit unions, your smaller loan companies, you know, they can use a little common sense and say, well, if this girl does default, we basically are getting the place for the thirty thousand dollar loan. Yeah. That, you know, but banks, it's just very cookie cutter. If you don't hit every every block, then they're just going to deny you. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I you know, you guys are. If you're if you're thinking that you're going to use your let's say your bank, um, that's just lazy. Yeah, it it literally is lazy. You know, it's the same issue with. I remember talking to uh, Mark Victor Hansen, who who wrote uh, Chicken Soup, uh, the Soul. And, and by the way, this happened at Rich Dad too. Uh, he got turned down by so many people; they didn't want the book. You know, and the same thing happens all the time. You got to get used to a lot of no's. You got to get used to that. It's just the way it is. And you just got to keep plowing ahead until you find the answer of yes. And you got to approach it from a standpoint where I'm shopping you around. I literally had a call this morning right before I came on the show here today between two groups trying to get us give us a, a $80 million in construction equity, by the way. And we have, it started with a bigger number and now it's down to the two. And now I'm looking at my spreadsheet and I'm talking to the broker who's representing us. I'm like, okay, so looking at the spreadsheet, where do you think we have room to negotiate? Because now we're comparing the two together. And that's the, that's really fun. Yeah. It's fun to negotiate these kind of terms and these fees and, and all that stuff. And they're negotiable. Yeah. You know, that's what you guys need to understand. It's it's not like something they push across the table and say you must do this. There's money is not treated equal out in the marketplace and I've found that a lot of times people have sometimes they have a lot of money and sometimes they have none. Now, I'm talking about financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is based on what they have coming in maybe or or what they've raised, let's say, or maybe deposits or whatever it might be. Then that ha then all of a sudden they have an incentive to lend more, and as so they're always watching. Think about banks are businesses too, so you know they're in the business of lend of taking your money through savings, and lending it to guys like me. That is how they make money. That's one way. So that is the system. The system is set up to where everyone gets their paycheck, puts it in the bank, and then the bank, of course, that's a liability to the bank. I know the bank's like, oh, I have, we have too much savings. Savings cost me X, let's say 1%, which is obviously high, but, but let's just use 1%. They, they owe 1% to everyone that's giving them money. So they have to go place it somewhere. That is the game. That's the system. So, you know, just know that. Know that it's expense to the bank. And so when a bank's sitting on money or anybody, I'm looking at these two groups today, one of them has... 20 billion out right now and the other one had 45 billion or something and their whole goal is to find good sponsors and give money to and, and the sponsor it's your job to negotiate the best deal you can on that money and it's your job to have lots of choices and it's not that hard it's actually fun you don't have to even go out i was at uh, i went to actually wells fargo the other day and this guy came in, I was at the teller, and he comes up, and, and he was behind me, and he's like, I'm interested in, in a home loan. And they're like, oh, we don't do that here anymore. I look over, and there's like, uh, you know, like a dozen open <laughs> spaces. You know, there's like no one in the bank. And uh, they're like, we do all that online now. And, uh, and the guy said, because of COVID, so I understand that and the pandemic and everything. But uh, you don't even have to go to, a, you know, banks don't even do that now in, in your local bank. Right. So the, the point is shop around, get competitive uh, and, uh, you, you know, and, and lock in fix long term. And Triumph asked, do you know if it'll hurt your credit if you shop around um, by applying to multiple different places? And the truth is it does bring your credit just a little bit, not nothing significant, but a little bit. So, yeah, you want to do a little research before you just apply. I wouldn't just apply. I would do no. a little research, make sure, you know, talk to somebody, make sure that they think that you could be qualified, find out what their rates are. You know, find out all the information. Don't yeah. just go applying everywhere. Guys, yeah. By the way, I'm not talking about applying. I'm actually, I'm talking about getting their terms and their rates. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, when I, when, when, when um, you know, when, a, when, a, um, when you're trying to buy a car from a dealer, they have, they know what their rates are. You know, they're going to tell you. So, and then they're going to say, oh, it's based on your credit. And we'll say, okay, my credit's X. So what's my rate? 
you know, and so, you know, it's all fi figured out. You don't have to apply. You don't have to fill out an application to get this information. Um, right. And so you're not, we're not actually running credit at this point. Right. So then the last tip we have from pro investors, and we've had a lot of questions on this today already. Should I sell my house and just wait for the market to downturn? You know, all these different questions, mm -hmm. whatever you buy, it has to cash flow. Yeah. And I talk a lot about this, you know, the difference between capital gains and cash flow. And when you have something that cash flows, you actually should be thinking, well, why, what am I going to do if I sell this? How am I going to, how's my money going to make money? You know, cause now it's going to go sit in a bank. So that's, or it's going to lose money. We've already talked yeah. about. So, so when it cash flows, you're actually in a much stronger position. If you're sitting on a bunch of capital gain, then different issue. And that's why, you know, we talk about why I sold some of my stuff, but I always want to have both. Now, obviously land doesn't cash flow. Anything speculative doesn't necessarily cash flow. Ground up construction and all that stuff for a period of time doesn't cash flow. And so if you're buying something and you're trying to assemble or you're trying to do something that has a, you know, one to two to three year time frame or, or even less, that's different. You know, that's more of a capital gain strategy, but like the billboard scenario, the billboard did not cash flow when I bought it. I, I think the, the sign was doing five grand a year or something. So it's inconsequential really. But the, my goal was different. It was placing the money, scooping the, um, you know, uh, taking the billboard and then, and then, and then getting that money back. The issue I have is now I got that 300 grand back and I'm like, okay, what do I do with that next? Right. So that's the issue. The issue is if it would have cash flowed, if I would have bought that deal and it, and and I could um, and I kept the billboard in the land, it still cash flows because I'm like doing two to four grand a month on that deal. So you're always looking at cash flow as, in, in my opinion, it is the key to to getting you guys out of all this mess that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's true we're seeing these big capital gains. The problem with selling. So we have a we uh, we have a property that we built Ross and I uh, in 2015 200 units or 192 units. And we owe uh we built it. So we owe like 24 million dollars, let's say. No and um we, I can't remember what we built it for, but you know, somewhere in the 30 mid 30s at the time, uh, back in 2015. We got an unsolicited offer for 71 million which is a lot, right? So all of a sudden you're looking at, geez, that's close to 50 million in profit. So then I took that and I sent it out to five brokers and they all gave us what's called a BOV or broker's opinion of value. And guess what? Those, those all came in over 90. So, so now, now we're, <laughs> we're looking at this. We got $90 million uh, for this 292 unit building in Phoenix. It's beautiful. And uh, we owe 24 million. So I sent it to my tax guy. And so it's like a $65 million. Think about that. Like 65 million bucks to sell one project. And, and um, um, Ross and I are like, what should we do? What should we do? And, and what we decided to do was um, do a cash out refi. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's, let's get an appraisal. Let's go. Let, so we called one of our lenders and said, you know, how much do you think you can scoop out of here? Because if I can scoop 30, 40 million bucks out of there, tax-free, then I can take that and roll it. But then I have to look at the stress test. So, you know, what's the new debt going to be against the current cash flow and all that kind of stuff? Because, um, you know, we still have some room, believe it or not, even though it's worth, let's say, 90 million, um, rents have gone up so fast in this area, we got some catching up to do, and I didn't want to leave that for the for the buyer. So uh, the point is, is I'm, I'm always using, the, the, the model is to use debt and harvest, 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 harvest your equity through cash out refis, fixed rate, and and keep those properties long term, especially while we're going into this inflationary period, and always make sure that it cash flows. So, um, obviously, we're going to. Uh, I've done this multiple times, guys. I have properties I've owned for a, a long time, and um, I've I've done uh, two and three cash out refis on these properties and I, I i've talked a lot about this you know but they always cash flow from the beginning always so i use that uh one of the ones that 
um, we own in Flagstaff. We bought for twenty million dollars, which at the time in two thousand five was like mind blowing for me. Um, and you know now that thing's worth you know somewhere between probably I don't know close to seventy million dollars, and we've refinanced it three times. You know I started with five million down, fifteen million dollar loan, let's say, and then you know and then after four or five years, I I was able to uh, get a twenty million dollar loan because I grew the uh, I, I grew the value, and that's when I became infinite. So I paid off the first at 15 and I got my five back. And so now I have zero investment in that deal. And so cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And so if I sell, let's say, and I, I'm sitting there with 30 or $40 million, then what? Like, do you, what, do you, what do you do with that? You put it in the bank, you give it to a financial planner, a wealth manager. When you guys can even think of that with your property. So if you're sitting on a house that's worth $300,000, it's the same way. So like a lot of you are asking, should you sell your house and wait till the crash? But if you sell your house and then you have, you know, a hundred grand, 150 grand, whatever you have in the bank, all that money is going to be doing is um, depreciating in value. And you don't know when the market is going to correct or if it's going to correct in your area. Yeah. So then basically now you're homeless, your rents have went up, your paying rent, your rents have went up. It's eating into that profit that you got, not to mention the tax you pay on it. Yeah. Right. So the issue is, is that you cash out, you pay tax, you pay capital gains. Um, and then in addition to that, what do you do with the money? Right. You know, now you're entering it at a high a high high price point so you know we, i get asked this question a lot we're building a home right uh, uh breaking ground next year on a, on a new home and ever the first question everybody asks the very first one and the standard question that i always know somebody's gonna ask is oh so you're gonna sell this one <laughs> every time it's like i go i don't know yet like i don't think so i probably gonna convert it into you know a, a rental a rental or yeah. maybe an airbnb it's an amazing home and, you know, it's fully furnished. I'm not going to bring any of the furniture over. So I don't know. But the point is, I'm, I, you know, it's an asset I have. And, uh, and, and so why not just cash flow the heck out of it? I don't want to be in single family rentals personally, but it's my home. And again, I could sell it and get, you know, millions of dollars in cash and all that. But then, then again, I'm like, okay, now what do I do with that? I'd rather actually house the, my equity and use the, use the debt to cash out, cash out, cash out, and harvest that money along the way. Um, and by the way, that's tax-free. So it's tax-free. Think about that. Like, we did a calculation on this money, on the, the example I gave you. The tax-free. Like, Ross Ross and I were like, okay, so what was capital gain, and what's this, and what are all the fees, and all that kind of stuff. And if we sold it, the net was actually close, you know, by the time we did a cash-out refi. And, and, you know, and that, but, uh, and tax free because guys, you're, it's, um, it's a cash out refi and you don't pay tax on debt. You owe it. So that's why it's tax free. Definitely. Definitely. And if you guys are watching, make sure you hit the like button. I would like to try to get it over a hundred. That is our goal. Oh, yeah. So hit that like button. Those, those are the five lessons. Hope you guys liked them. Um, we noodle over these uh, all weekend. Yeah, definitely. And now we're going to move into our premium questions. But before we do that, don't forget to sign up for the wholesaling webinar. Wholesaling is a great way to get started, especially if you don't have any money down or you're a good salesperson. So kemmackroy.com forward slash webinar. It is next week. A lot of great information. The guy we have coming in to teach it, that's all he does. He's built his whole business around wholesaling. So you will learn a lot of great stuff and I'll be hosting it. So, <laughs> all right. So our first premium question is actually coming from Nate. He's watching live on Facebook. He said, Hey guys, um, if I'm in an area that there's a lot of apartment development going on, how is that affecting the value of the surrounding homes? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, it can, it can be negative. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just be honest. Uh, you, you know, they have this word called NIMBY, not in my backyard, you know. Right. Uh, you know, when, you, when, when you're looking at a home purchase, let's say, uh, there is zoning, typically an overlay, a zoning map that says this is single family, this is commercial, this is multifamily, this is industrial, as an example. This is going to be a park. So it's all zoned and all figured out. So as you're buying, you need to make take a look at the, you know, what your property is adjacent to. Now... If they're class A, really nice properties, because they're brand new, they, which they probably are, because you can't build anything cheap today and land is expensive, um, it might actually be a benefit. It's hard to say, it depends on the value of your home. But there are markets um, that, you know, 
that uh, where the, the homes are very expensive, like Plano, Texas, which I'm in, or Scottsdale, Arizona, which obviously I live in, where if an apartment complex got built right next to, you know, uh, a very expensive home, then, of course, I think you're right. Uh, but in some cases, if it's a if it's an area like like the like Tempe, Arizona, uh, which is near Arizona State, you got a lot of homes that are built in the 60s and 70s there. Well, if a brand new apartment property is built right next to it, it probably helps it. Yeah. So it just depends on 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 where it is. That's a good question. Yep, definitely. And uh, Matt, to answer your question, who's the wholesale guy we're bringing on? It's Matt Kemp from Deal Machine. It's his whole business is wholesaling. So Matt Kemp. All right. So next question, our next premium question comes from Kevin. He, this is a good one. I've heard that LLCs established in Wyoming establish the, have the best protections. Can I establish an LLC there for properties in another state? Okay, Kevin. So, um, this is a legal question, but I'm going to attempt to answer it. So, uh, but this is not legal advice. Yeah. But one of the things that, you know, go to Garrett Sutton, suttonlaw.com, um, and, and for this, the reason why we use Wyoming, believe it or not, is because the filing fees are the cheapest in the country. So this has more to do with the expense side of it. So if you take a look at your, your uh, you know, to, to maintain LLCs correctly, there's annual fees that each state charges. And um, I, I'm not going to just throw a number out, but I know California is like among the highest and New York are among the highest. Wyoming is, or at least it was, one of the lowest. The LLC document itself actually is generated by an attorney. So, you know, the contents of what's in the LLC between the, the, uh, the, uh, the limited partners and, and the general partner, or, you know, um, or the managing partner and the, uh, the limited, uh, let's see, member managed, I'm trying to remember all the words. I'm going, I'm, I've got all this stuff, GP, LP. Um, the, the, those, that document, that can sail from any state to state. So you can use the legal language from a document in, in, in Nevada, uh, in Wyoming, or Arizona and Wyoming. So that's a little bit different. The operating agreement and the partnership structure and all that, that's a little bit different. Um, you know, and that's, um, uh, you got to dig deep into the operating agreement, which is really important, by the way, guys. It's actually just something I thought of. If, if you just set up an LLC and you have a partnership, that operating agreement is very important, guys. It talks about cash calls and it talks about waterfalls, which is how the money comes out, uh, what those look like. It talks about the voting rights. And so there's some things that do come up and have come up a lot in my company and my partnerships. So if, you do, if you've just set up an LLC, that next step of having a partnership agreement or an operating agreement is important. And I do think there's a little stronger protection in Wyoming, actually. Okay, um, yeah, there because, might be, yeah. Uh, I was actually just talking to Mauricio about this this morning, okay. and he's our... Um, He's our advisor for the premium members. Oh. He's our attorney. Um, why don't we uh, Why don't we shoot him this question? Yeah, that would be great. So, we'll answer that over on yeah, our premium so we, page. As you guys know, we brought on a couple advisors because of these kinds of questions. That, you know, be careful you know, when you ask me for legal advice. So that's why I brought <laughs> a licensed attorney, a syndicated, uh, syndication attorney. Uh, he's actually licensed. Um, uh, uh, Mauricio Raul um, and Eric Freeman uh, are for tax advice. So those are... This is a great question to send to them. And we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll post this. On uh, our forum. Yeah, on our forum, which, by the way, we're making live soon. December 1st. Yeah, December 1st. So Nick from Premium wanted to know, what is your suggestion if you're looking to purchase a whole, like a, a five-unit complex, but it only has three electric meters? So he said uh, it's very expensive yeah. to move that to five. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. But how do you work it if one person yeah, is using great more question. gas than the yeah, other? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, really ex uh, great question. Uh, first of all, I w what's interesting is there was only five, so I, I would wonder what you know what the history is. You know, because normally, um, um, you know, you would have five, but uh, or or one. So three is interesting. But regardless of that, um, you might want to dig into that. By the way, so but um, you're right. The last thing you, you don't need to to do that. So when we buy a property that's, let's just say it's master metered, 
Let's say there's a 300 unit building that's master metered. And this is what this, is master metered? So, mean? master, so these would be properties that are built in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And we would normally not buy these personally. But a master metered property means exactly what this means it means that there's one meter that regulates all heat um, and air and all that stuff. Uh, what, literally one electric meter for the whole project. This is the way it used to be. Uh, there also used to be master boilers and master chillers and all that kind of stuff. So hot water, heat. So um, you, you, you guys, have, you hopefully you've run over uh, projects that, that say, um, you know, electric, heat, water, all included. Oh, I've lived in one of those in oh, college. It okay. was uh, it was horrible, actually, because okay, well, because I like my temperature around like 74 and it ran right around 68 and you really couldn't yeah. control the heat or the air. So this is why, oh, because the, the landlord is like <laughs> that difference between 78 or 68 and 74 is a lot of money. So it's controlled by the landlord. So but here's the way around it. There's a. Uh, the industry started embracing this scheme called RUBS, Resident Utility Billing. So um, what you would do is you take the, the cost of the electric, whatever it is. Let's just say it's uh, $500 a month, and you divide it by five. And when they rent it, you put it in the lease. You say your rent is X plus $100 in electric. So you make it part of... Um, and then that way you don't have to break the electric meter up. Uh, essentially, you just take whatever the meter is and you charge that back to the resident each and every month. We do that with trash, sewer, water, electric. So, so we pass all utilities back and we don't actually care if they're individually metered. And, and so that's a great way to, to get around that and, and allocate that back. So you're still going to pay the expense still going to show up on your financial as an expense for electric, but you'll also have an offsetting income line item to cover it. Um, and also you want to set that up uh, so that it, you're not making profit from it. So you just want to pass that cost through and, and just write it into the lease that way. Definitely. So next question is from Mia from premium. So she is wondering, should she refinance and pull cash out for a, her next purchase or she should or should she do a HELOC against one of her properties? So basically, she's debating between a HELOC and a cash out refi. Yeah, so I, I don't. It does, but the cost of the debt is what you look at. Well, HELOCs are usually um, only 10 year and they're typically adjustable. So there you go. Yeah. So it depends on the terms of, of, of the, the money. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if you have a, an opportunity to um, do a HELOC on something that you own that's cash flowing, you might want to take a look at a refinance instead of a key lock. Yeah. But um, you, it depends. You know, there's a the, what we don't know are the terms and, and the interest rates and the leverage and all that kind of stuff. So I always tell people just do what you're comfortable with. And, and you know, if you have a property that's vacant all the time and you're having a heck of a time filling it, then you probably want to avoid it. Yeah. You well, and, and also, you know, you always say you don't want to be in adjustable rate debt right now because it's going to move. Yeah. Now, if this is something Mia, that you're going to pay off in the next couple so, of years. Yeah, so you then, did this. Right? Didn't you do it? Yeah, I, I use me my HELOCs for my down payments. So I like to use my HELOCs for um to put a down payment knowing though that I'm going to then refinance it into yeah. a loan. Yeah. That's fixed. So you did it for less than a year, right? Oh yeah, just for a so, few months. Yeah, yeah, so so what you did, if I remember, is that you put a HELOC on something to get the loan cash right away and be able to execute on something else. Yeah, because I was basically a cash buyer. Yeah. And then you moved toward a refinance to pay off the HELOC. Correct. But you yeah. just need to make sure that you'll be able to get that refinance because yeah. it definitely was a lot harder than I thought. And it did work out great. But it, you know, they are going to ask a lot of additional questions of you yeah. on this one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question, though. Yes, definitely. Well, and then the, the bad part about the refi is now you're sitting on all this cash and you might not buy something right away. So now you're paying interest on money that's just sitting in your account. Oh, that's too bad. So you yeah. got tax free income and you're upset. Well, you're paying. Well, you're paying I'm just saying. What about a cap? What about a buy. capital gain? <laughs> like that's actually worse. It, actually, not having a place where you, you you know scooping all that equity and sitting on it. Fair, fair. Um, okay. So Dustin from Premium wants to know they have over fifty percent equity in their house. Um, 
So basically they want to know, should they sell their house now while they have equity in it or they, should they wait? And then, you know, home prices may drop. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where you live. I, 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 I kind of set my house over here as something I don't mess around with. So yeah. first of all, I don't, you know, to do real estate deals, to actually buy anything, you don't actually need your own money. Most people want their own money, but the truth is the it's actually about the next deal. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to, um, uh, I, well, first thing is I, I like 50% debt on home mm -hmm. personally. Um, I don't like to push it much beyond that, but if you were to do that, then you would want a spot for that money. Right. Right. So, so, so I, I built my house. I've actually had it for 15 years and I love it. But what I've done is I built it with like a 2.5% construction loan, which rolled into a perm. And then of course it went up in value. And so what I did was I just been harvesting, but I've always kept, um, I only owe like 800 grand on my house and I just keep a little bit on there and it's worth, you know, several million dollars. And I just kind of have that there. Um, I could pull a million bucks out of that, but I don't want to, you know, right. because then the question is, is, unless I need it, let's say, let's say shit hit the fan and I needed it, then I would use the house for stuff. But, but I would never do it unless I could buy something that's, um, you know, was intentional. And because I have so much going on in my, um, in my business itself, I don't. But uh, the, the, the issue would be, what are you going to do with the money and why? You know, because your payment's going to go up. Well, I think what people are trying to do is they're trying to sell their house, cash out the equity, and then rebuy the house or a different house when the market goes down. And I actually had friends that tried to do this back in probably around 16. So they bought their house at a really good deal in 2011. And then they sold it in 16 because they wanted to cash out on that money and then bank what they had and they were going to wait for the market to go down. Well, so then they rented for four years and finally oh, wow. in 20, they had to buy another house and it was even higher. So they would have been so much better off just staying in the house that they were originally at, but they felt like they were at the height of the market. So when you guys are trying to sell your house now because you think the market's peaking, which it may or may not be in your area. And then, you know, with the government intervention, you know, we keep thinking the market's going to correct, but the government keeps interfering. So it might not correct for five more years. Yeah. And then you're going to be screwed out of all that equity and also have to go buy in at a higher cost if you can afford to. Yeah. The, uh, here's one strategy, though, that you could employ, and that is, and people have, are doing this right now. If you're in California and you're moving to Arizona, everything's a deal. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they're selling, you know, a, a million and a half, $2 million home, which is, you know, you can buy uh, an amazing home in Arizona. So th that's not a bad strategy. If you're moving laterally over somewhere and you're getting more home for less, then not a bad idea. Right. But if you're trying to, come into the your existing sub market then it might not be to your point a good idea so but people are doing that right now as they relocate uh, go to the rural areas and they're buying bigger land you know kind of getting out of the city based on w w what a lot of people have went through so the migration is very interesting right now to, to watch but if you're in the northeast or california let's say or even seattle area things are a bargain pretty much in a lot of spots. Definitely. And if you are downsizing, that's a good point. You know, that's great. If you have a big house and you're moving to a, you know, you move into a condo, then yeah, it's the right time to sell because you're going to so cash out that, that money. Yeah. My yeah. sister did that. They had a big home. They raised their family in and it's like a five bedroom home with a lot of land. And it was just her and her husband. And so she sold it like in the last six months mm -hmm. and uh, moved to a different area completely and bought just actually um, you know much smaller home but a lot of land and in an area with a nice view and all that and it was a lot less so you know so she got to put her some uh, cash in her pocket and uh, you know obviously still has a home that she wants to but I, I always this is a general rule I don't like to mess around with my primary residence it's, yeah it's a little risky I don't use, you know I don't use it as a bank, as a ATM yep and Matt brought up a good point. He said, you know, even if you do and you wait and prices go down, you're probably going to have a higher interest rate, which might not good make point. it. So, yeah, very you know, your, know your payment may be the same. Guys. Yeah, interest rates yeah. are, that is a factor too. 
So Scott from Premium wanted to know, he owns an 18-unit apartment complex um, with a loan for 1.4 at 4% with a 30-year payment. Well, they'll be subject to change in three and a half years. It's kind of long. <laughs> um, he spoke to the bank and they're willing to refi the loan at 4.5% for 15 years. Would this be a good way to proceed uh, considering that we may have some future rate increases? Well, uh, it's a lot of stuff in there, but, but, uh, Wait, I, do you want me to recap it for you? Cause it was kind of long. No, I got it. Okay. So I think, um, first of all, 4% is not bad and I can't say it now. So there you go. 4% is not bad. So if you can keep it at 4%, um, and that payment works and you're cash flowing like crazy, but it's only for three and a half years. Uh, oh, three and a half years. Yeah. No, then I would not. I thought, it's, I thought you said 15 years. No, that's what he wants to move it to, 4.5% for 15 oh, years. Oh, so would, basically up a half a percent yeah, to lock it I would in. shop around. Um, I don't know. You know, we don't know where rates are going to be in three and a half years, and, and that's really your issue. Your issue is is uh, interest rate risk. So um, shop around. Nobody, nobody cares, uh, you know, uh, where you get your money from. Hopefully you don't care. Like right. it does not matter. Trust me. But you definitely don't want to be in an adjustable three no, year loan no, right now. No, you want to be fixed and, and hedge. You know, I think four is a little high for 18 units. So four and a half is certainly too high. Okay. Uh, the other thing you want to look at are your points. You know, what are you paying for that? A lender is charging you, you know, maybe a point or two points or something like that. So that's all negotiable. I would go out. Uh, we 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 kind of beat that that lesson up earlier, on you know shop shop the loan around. Definitely, and Michael has a good point. He said, "Don't try to time the market. It's better to set aside uh, some amount for yeah. buying opportunities." Yes, and I think that's great. You guys stop trying to time the market. You're not flippers. You may win, but if you lose, you're probably going to lose pretty hard. It's happened to me, guys. You know, but what saved me was cash flow. Period. Yeah. It literally saved my butt in uh, 2005 in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas is arguably one of the hottest markets in the country, but I bought there and all of a sudden the market went down. And what saved me was a full property. Yep, definitely. All right, guys. Well, that is going to wrap for today. Make sure you join the wholesale webinar, com slash webinar. I will be hosting it. It will be very informative. It's free. Also, hit the like button. We'd like to get to 150. See if we can get 11 more people to wow. do it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate <laughs> right, it. See you guys As next always, week. you're the best.